I got to meet Michael through a mutual friend of ours. Uh, actually, the, from my high school, uh, he was the most likely to succeed. And he's actually, uh, you know, he's lived up to the, uh, the mantra. In, in, in of all odds, that guy has succeeded. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, he was, uh, you know, our mutual friend is, was a partner at, or is a current partner at Boston Consulting Group where I believe Michael and, and Justin met um, and, and forged a relationship. Uh, so, yeah, it's been it's been great to kind of stay connected through the years. And, uh, you know, as, as someone who's always trying to learn, you know, why not, you know, communicate with someone who's been doing it on a large scale with uh, some of the biggest brands in the country? So, you know, wanted to introduce him to, to not just our uh, the people on the call, but also, you know, when we have the fireside chat and it's live on the Internet um, so you can you know gain some knowledge from it. So uh, it's going to be kind of an informal fireside thing with the llamas, with the skull. Um, yeah, I have to explain that one. It's, I'm not a Vikings fan. I, I lost a bet. It's so. Don't get any ideas. So, you know, uh, just to kind of kick things off, um, just maybe give the give the group and give everyone a little background of, you know, uh, you know, what was Michael like in high school and did he see himself where he's at today? Yeah, I, I definitely did not um, dress as a consultant or restaurant executive for Halloween when I was a kid. Um, but, you know, I. I am some a little bit about me. I'm from North Carolina, from Charlotte, uh, went to UNC, uh, lived in Atlanta for a little while doing banking, went to uh, Chicago to go to grad school, got my MBA there at Northwestern. That's actually where I met Justin and then uh, went down to Dallas for 10 years and worked in management consulting at the Boston Consulting Group. And now I've been at Bloomin' Brands, which is the company that owns Outback Steakhouse, Bravo's Italian Grill, Bonefish Grill, and Fleming's Prime Steakhouse. So a nice range of restaurants, all of which I you know, personally like. Uh, you know, growing up and as in my formative years through high school and college, I was dead set on knowing what I wanted to do. There was a, a, a guy in Charlotte that was a mentor to me. And, um, you know, I was absolutely certain I was gonna follow in his footsteps in his business. I saw college as being a check the box kind of thing and, you know, just go ahead and move on to that. Um, but what I discovered when I got to college, there's this whole other world out there. And so then I you know, explored the finance world. And then when I went to grad school, it was like, whoa, there's this whole other new world. I just kept it, 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 seeing these new opportunities. And my personality is such that when I see a lot of options, I go into full paralysis mode and I say, oh, I have no idea what I want to do. No clue what I want to do with my life. So. I will do the job that allows me to not decide what I want to do, which is management consulting. Uh, and even then, my background in banking was in the energy industry. And when I got to consulting, I became a consumer and retail and restaurant and hospitality expert. So, you know, certainly for me, no path was prescribed. Uh, and my my goal was to spend two years at BCG and learn some ropes around analytics and around client service and understanding you know, how to create value in an organization. Uh, Ten years later, I finally left. And it was because I kept learning. And I found that everything I every decision I made about my career starting you know, back then until now is do something where you're going to keep learning. That said, you know, 10 years in my BCG career, I decided that keep continuing to learn at the expense of having a personal life was not acceptable to me. And so I jumped over to my favorite client, which was Bloomin' Brands. I'd worked with them for five or so years. And, you know, I'm finding that a lot of what I did in consulting translates over here where there's intellectual curiosity. Um, there's a lot of prioritization that has to happen. And, and just to give you some context on my job now. So I'm called the chief customer officer. You could call me a chief commercial officer or whatever you want to say. But basically, I'm in a functional group that supports all of our brands. And we do um, all of the technology, whether that's corporate technology, whether that's customer facing technology, e-commerce, websites, apps, the loyalty program, data and analytics, our media and digital deployment. So a lot of things in my world that, um, you know, I never thought I'd, I'd be in charge of all that, but I'm learning a ton. And, you know, I got asked to lead IT, which I've never done any IT before. and 
you know, it's it's great because you get to learn it, but you also get to apply basic, you know, questions of what does it cost, what does it do, what happens if we don't have it. So, learning along the way, and um, it's been really fun to get to know, um, you know, Josh. I've obviously I've known Josh for a little while, but to get to know the company a little better, and uh, it's just a great opportunity. I'd love to hear well, like one of the challenges or the, one of the projects you got uh, early on or maybe midway through your time there in the hospitality industry that that's uh, that really kind of like opened your eyes or you like it was like a kind of like stake in the ground kind of project where you're like, wow, we came in, they had this massive problem, we consolidated X, it created Y, and I'm, you know, I'm Jesus, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I was with you. Uh, here's one thing that it, it always struck me as as fascinating when I was working at BCG. So I was with all these companies that you'd heard of, and then I remember finally I got to one that was just a behemoth. And you always assume that all these companies have their stuff together, and they're all buttoned up and perfect, and it's seamless. And every single time I get into a new company, there was some like, I, how much cussing can I do? Uh, there, there, there was lots of shows, uh, and it was it was amazing to see that the most some of the most basic stuff, you know, it, it just wasn't in place. And so what I take from that now, as as a person inside of a large company that people have heard of our brands, you know, I see things that are broken, and you can you can try to fix them, but you don't have to feel bad about it. So with your business, there may be things that you know aren't perfect, but trust that those imperfect things are happening at companies that are you know, a hundred, a thousand, or, you know, 10,000 times the size of yours. But there was one in particular uh, in the hospitality industry where they had, so it was a hotel company, they had, you know, multi, multi, multi-billion dollars and millions and millions and millions of bookings a year. And the insight that they had on where the booking came from, which channel it came from, uh, some of the rate dynamics, uh, what type of customer was it that booked, it was just a lot of basics that they you know, didn't have together. And the the project that we took on at the time was to take all the raw data and make a manipulatable or manipulable, whatever the word is, user-friendly database that says, okay, if I cut it by brand, by city, by uh, by date, by whatever, I can see that this group is coming in more likely here, this one more likely here. And so they said, great, that's cool. Uh, now take it the next step and tell us how much each booking costs. And so we did down to the penny of how much each booking costs, whether it came through the phone, whether it came through online or whatever, and the amount of insight and the amount of activity that that led to and realizing that if they just pushed online bookings by a fraction of a percent, you know, that translates into lots and lots of dollars for them. And so just that foundational piece of work kicked off, I mean, A, a lot of work for the for my former firm. Uh, and by the way, the closer you are to the data, the more opportunity you have to uh, spread that value into the world. Uh, but it also continue to highlight issues that they have within their own business. Let's take, for example, within that company, 40% of their total volume was in group bookings, and they had zero visibility onto their group bookings. So here again, you just keep peeling things back and peeling things back, and you're saying like, "Wow, this giant company should have all this together, but they didn't." And this was 10 years ago, so they're they're great now, obviously. But yeah, that was a a big big lesson for me is the power of holding data and telling people something they don't know about their own business, and it just opens all the doors. Because I I like I liked to say back then that I loved doing work that involved data. I hated doing work that involved you know, benchmarking and opinions and, you know, feelings, uh, because that I'd rather be unemotional when I walk into a room and tell a CEO something that is not good news about their business. So you guys have a lot of data and uh, you're generating more and more. So that is a very, very good thing. When it came to, uh, I guess, defining your next move from BCG to, to Bloom and Brands, how much, you know, you had kind of an inside scoop because they were a current uh, customer of BCG's, right? Yep. 
That's right. So, and, and by and by the way, it's the only. It's, so I've worked with a lot of companies, and I, and everyone would always say like, oh, you're just going to find one of your companies that you work with, and you're going to jump right in. It's interesting when you do that because you see the good and the bad, and there's surely good and bad everywhere. Uh, to me, it came down to the people where I walked into the the hallways here, and it just felt like I was home every time I was here, and that. That ultimately, I don't know if you're going to ask, but that was ultimately why I decided this was the place for me. So that's, I guess that's the thing. So you were spending a lot of time at their corporate headquarters. Like how much time? Like Mm -hmm. like weeks, months? For for months at a time, I'd be here four days a week. And forging the relationships was so important. And this is, I was actually talking about this the other day with um, a very senior person who's still at BCG, not, not our mutual friend, but, um, he was asking me what I thought about the future of travel and the future of doing business in person versus like this. And my belief is that you'll never be able to replace the in-person uh, component of it. So when you guys are out there, you know, spreading the word and trying to, to build the portfolio, still being in a room with somebody and talking about things that have nothing to do with business. That's how I forged the relationships here. It was like, Number one, are you going to do good work, and are you going to tell it like it is? Number two, can we stand you? Right. You know? And not just that, do we like you? That's kind of how it, how it played out for me. Now, how did you? How much did you know about the role you were going into before you actually went into the role? And was there someone in that role before you? You know, like, or did they just kind of create this 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 package for you? No, there there were two people actually. There was a leader of IT, and there was a leader of the, the digital side, both of which had moved on um, from the company. And so it was a combination of those two sides. And, you know, I knew somewhat of what was going on, uh, but until you get into the details of it, you never really know. But I remember day one of my job, um, there's a woman named Gail who is in charge of our online ordering system and all of our customer facing technology. And she walks in my office and says, Hey Stutz, it's a, by the way, everyone just calls me Stutz. Josh knows this, but Michael is, an, is not a name I'm typically called. But like, hey Stutz, uh, nice to meet you. By the way, our online ordering system went down last night and it caused a massive, massive, you know, dip in sales. I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> so why did that happen and how do we make that not happen again? So I was like, great, day one, awesome. Uh, <laughs> and then there were, there were a few more little surprises like that, but it was great to be able to take all these issues that were happening at once and say, okay, let's, let's all get together as a group and prioritize. And that's what we did. I spent the first probably six months with the team prioritizing what we were going to take on. You, you also, you know, just to give the, uh, the listeners a, a better picture. You started what in the beginning of 2019 or 2018? Yeah, it was, uh, June 2019, um, I'd started kind of coming back around in, in March, April as a, uh, you know, as the, kind of in between time between BCG and, and here and then full time starting in, in June. So you got a full almost nine months before COVID. Mm-hmm. And I guess how many different initiatives or projects were you working on uh, before COVID? You, you know, just to give everyone a sense. Your goal or your job title is get people to the restaurants, right? Yeah, it's gen- generate demand, right? Like, and and really, it's it's meant to be a an infrastructure through which the brands and brand marketing can you know work its way through. And that's we, we're not here to make decisions on behalf of brands. We're here to to enable brands to uh, to be successful. So our mantra inside of my team that you know beaten into people's heads is. We exist to remove the barriers between exchanging food for money, right? Like we, we are there solely to enable a person giving us dollars and us giving them food. Uh, and that's, it sounds very unemotional because we do like to just deal in, in fact and technology. So we obviously have emotional. different brands. There. Did you like, <clears throat> did you have to have a different strategy for each brand? So it was like, Here's our strategy for Carabas. Here's our strategy for, you know, um, Outback. And the the strategy was, yeah, and, and some small components, yes, but broadly speaking, it's we need a reliable online ordering platform that works regardless of brand. And the brand can do a different look and feel, obviously different menu items, pricing, all that. But we're there to make that easy for them. 
we're here to have a loyalty program that all of our brands are plugged into and can generate, you know, repeat business, but also generate data. We have a communications platform through email and SMS that every brand uses. We're basically a scale builder for all of our brands. And before COVID, it's actually funny. I get this question sometimes as well. What changed pre-COVID and post-COVID? The answer is nothing. We had, for at least for my group, we had a list of priorities and there were six priorities. We'll just call them one through six. And it was like, here you go, team. We came up with this together. It was February, literally February, 2020. Here it is. We presented it to the leadership to our executive leadership team that I'm on and our board of directors and said, this is what we're going after. A month later, COVID happens. One of those five came off um, and, and it was because of a capital constraint. And then we added another one in that I'm excited to tell you about in a moment. But um, so, yeah, nothing really changed because we had to do some foundational work around our technology stack and around some of our processes and some of our partnerships. And so that didn't change. But the one that did change, and I cannot get off of a, uh, a meeting like this without talking about our virtual brand. So a lot of you have heard about ghost kitchens and virtual brands and whatnot, and that's one of the sexy topics in the restaurant world. Um, and for those that don't know, a ghost kitchen is basically using unbranded kitchen assets in different cities and running brands through them. So you could have one location with 10 different brands. You have a taco brand, a, a chicken tender brand, a slider brand, whatever. And there's a lot of companies getting massive valuation right now in you know, Silicon Valley and elsewhere to build that kind of model. So fast forward to COVID time, that blows up even more because these exist and then the third party delivery companies just swoop them up and take them out and deliver them. When the world went off premises, it became an even bigger deal. So we pretty much looked at ourselves and said, well, why can't we do this in our existing restaurants? So um, a team, a very cross-functional team that I work on um, came up with this idea that let's provide a platform like that Let's provide a product and a menu and a brand and leverage our relationship with DoorDash and put this into our own restaurants. So in September, we launched a brand called Tender Shack. It's available only on DoorDash. The entire menu is chicken tenders, chicken tender sandwiches, fries, cookies, sauces. That's it. So from a world of casual dining that's, you know, 80 items and a big thick menu, we've got five things. And right now it's in a handful of Carabas. It's about to be in a handful of Outbacks. And then we're hoping that it performs in a way that will allow it to be a national thing. Uh, you're doing all the, you're taking all the orders and it's, it's a separate revenue stream. Like, so well, it's like, it's not tied to that, that Outback or that Caraba. Okay, so this, this is all accounting, but yes, yeah, so it's, it's effectively a product that we created in our functional group that the brands can adopt and use in their restaurants. And of course, we're working very closely with them. And it, all it does, because we're, we're a functional group, we exist to drive traffic into brands. They keep, obviously, I mean, it's all internal, but it's their revenue. It's Caraba's revenue, it's Outback's revenue. Yeah, yeah. But it's just the, the button on the point of sale says Tender Shack, you know, chicken tenders. And it's been probably the number one most, um, fulfilling, enjoyable, you know, proud project of my entire career. Uh, just to take a, a moment in time that kind of sucks and to find the opportunity and the, you know, the need to do something like that, that this company probably would have never done, you know, due to risk aversion a year ago. Uh, and plus the food is really good. Uh, we have We have it here in Tampa, obviously, and I order it at least twice a week. It's it's pretty killer. Um, but, yeah, that's that's the only really like new initiative that we put into place that wasn't already there. I've told a lot of people that nothing about COVID created any new trends. All it did was accelerate existing trends. So working on having order at the table in the restaurant. Well, before it was because you wanted convenience. Now it's because you don't want to touch each other or whatever. So, yeah, it's it's. Uh, you guys are, yeah, I remember some of the restaurant groups going with that, like the tablet concept, <clears throat> but that's kind of bulky. And I heard some, some negative things about that, but the QR code to ordering, are you guys doing any of that? We are. 
So we're doing, and, and we did not do the tablet thing. Uh, there's a franchisee out out in the, the West Coast that does it, but all of our owned and operated restaurants, which is the, the bulk of our restaurants, do not use them. Uh, I think we're very happy about that from a couple of angles. One, they're kind of tough to maintain. Two, they're a little bit dirty, and you, you touch them and they get kind of sticky. Uh, but three, the whole world is going toward everyone brings their own screen. Yeah. And you look at what airlines are doing, it's the same thing. But that said, the future state is I've got my phone, here's a QR code, boom, here's my menu. And what we're finding is that some people are completely fine doing the QR code menu, and some people will you know, rip your head off if you don't have a paper menu for them. Uh, and that's fine. That's going to be the evolution of the world. And yeah, does that, does that, I assume that's geography based? Like if you're in age. <laughs> age. Um, some of our customers, uh, yep. especially those that are on the call, but also th those that are going to be listening to this later. So I like how you're saying uh, go hyper local, but most of them are, you know, for example, even when it comes to their uh, beverage offerings, they heavily go and offer the local. What would you give them as a recommendation to really um, adjust to this new normal? A lot of them will just do deliveries, you know, so would you say that partnering up with these thir third parties might be the good way for them? I know that some of them hate it. <laughs> I, I do hear a lot of like negative uh, talks about how yeah. like, of a percentage they take from them on a sales. They take a lot. Yeah. yeah. So, I Here's here's my so the new normal is not that from a core business standpoint. I don't know and I, when I say I don't know. I mean I'm I'm not saying that I'm denying that things are going to be different. I'm saying that nobody really knows. However, what we believe in the casual dining world is that you're you're going to have people who want to be social and want to be together, uh, and I think that any any concept that's using self-pouring taps is going to fall into a category of a place people can't wait to get back to where they can share experiences with each other. And if you're a restaurant that has a four-wall brick-and-mortar presence and you're not fostering social relationships, I don't know why you exist. Like, if you're there for people to sit there by themselves, I, I don't know what that is. So once the once the world comes somewhat back to normal, 80% of the business fundamentals, I think, are going to be the same, meaning how you operate. However, what we're preparing for is a world where you're always going to have some amount of uh, barrier between, you know, germs and whatnot. You're going to have some just common sense, like, duh, you can't spread germs like this. And then self-pouring taps, you know, that does create some challenge. There's going to have to be a little bit of uh, – you know, additional security, you know, safety measures around sanitization and all of that. But so much of it is going to be theater versus actual, um, you know, practice. So I know that sounds cynical, but it's, you know, it's, it's, I think we, we think that's kind of the way it's going to be. So I don't think that really looking at a total change in business model is going to be necessary and having to run to the third parties. I think it's more about, giving someone a great experience they're going to feel comfortable and safe with uh, and making them not feel guilty and coming back to a place and being around people. Uh, it's really interesting. I'll, I'll give you, I'm, I know I'm answering this question a really long way, but some of my experience at BCG uh, with consumer insights around restaurants has taught me something. People say and do very different things. When you do research, they'll say, I'm never going to, you know, let's take, let's take a restaurant menu. Oh, I'm, the health is number one for me. It's got to be healthy. Got to have a salad. And you hear them in focus groups. Oh, yeah, that's too many calories. And then you look at that same restaurant's sales mix, and it's like all burgers and fries and shakes, whatever. <laughs> People stay and do different things. What we saw when the world reopened you know, a couple months ago before it seems to be closing again is that 75% of people said, I am very nervous about going into restaurants. But yet we had, you know, full restaurant or up to capacity restaurants and we had weights and we had plenty of people coming out. So it is at least my hope and the hope of you know, my colleagues here is that we're going to get back to a, a world where people are social together again. And it really is going to be about the combination of giving someone a great experience, but also giving them enough safety measures where they feel like they're not doing bad on the world.
when uh, when COVID started, I mentioned that we have tight um, tight delivery radii radii, yeah, so that we can get food to put, you know, people at the right time, at the right temperature. Well, when COVID hit, we expanded those zones out because there was no traffic on the roads. And so what used to be, you know, a 20 minute drive became an eight minute drive. And so it's just one of the weird things that that happens when you have a global pandemic occur. Um, and how did, that, to communicate that nationwide, that's got to be I mean, that's uh, I mean, you're basically doubling your your ability, you know, your client base. Right. I mean, if not tripling. Because what happens is that you um, we have these these polygons in our system that bring in addresses and whatever. Now, if I go on my app and say I want delivery, here's my address. Is delivery available? Boom. Now it's available. It may not have been in the past, but in the past, you may not have been looking to get delivery from Outback. But in right. a situation where everyone's getting delivery from everywhere, then you're going to look. Um, but, yeah, we had, to, we had to bring them back in as things opened up. Uh, but yeah, it's it's been pretty fascinating to watch that team do its thing. They're on my team and they're amazing. So I'd, I'd be curious to get Tanya's uh, take on this. But you know, just she deals a lot with our most of our customers are uh, single location. You know, entrepreneurs that had had to you know had to drive to open up a self pour tap room. And we just did some market analysis of like what percentage of them have food versus don't. But, you know, from a marketing perspective, I'd, I'd love to see if there's there's some, you know, some some things that you've you've seen. Like when you're looking at how do you get traffic into your location? Do you have very clear buckets? Is it like it's, you know, web traffic, uh, you know, commercials, um, yeah. rewards programs? Like how how yeah. are you breaking up your bucket? We actually just looked at this the other day, um, literally last night at like midnight. I was pouring through conversion rates across channels, but we have had a very hard time over the years parsing out what works. Is it TV? Is it social media? Is it gift cards? Is it, you know, whatever else, loyalty program, like you said, just general coupons or what have you. And we didn't have a great measurement tool in place. We invested the time and the money and the people to create a single source of truth on, okay, the ROI on, this was, you know, so and so. This didn't work, and we can do that by campaign. We can do it by channel. And just to, you know, give give you the short answer, people love free stuff. Uh, it turns out that you know, gift cards and discounting that kind of stuff really does work. But what also works, and we've discovered this largely through the Tender Shack work we've done, because we have a little marketing team that does this off the side of their desk. Tender Shack, for all intents and purposes, is a local restaurant for what most people see. They see on their DoorDash, boom, there it is. Investing in the digital assets that are hyper-localized for a one-off, that is what matters. And so the way we've run Tender Shack marketing is, okay, we opened a new location in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which we did, this is very true. Um, we did some paid Instagram posts in there. We paid the money on DoorDash to do free delivery, so it puts us up in the carousel. It puts us in the carousel, and it puts us high on the, the rank order list when you look up chicken, and it matters. And so because we you know, had that good placement, we were able, and I'm talking very small dollars, our, in the, the, the hun, low hundreds of dollars for you know, all that kind of work, um, we, we got so much attention in Baton Rouge that a local TV station did a chicken tender challenge between us and Raisin Cane's. And we're like, okay, that's cool. And they had no idea. They're like, where does this even come from? We don't know what this is, but whatever, it's good. So yeah, hyper local using digital resources. There's so many options out there and the scale is there that a local restaurant can really get a lot more audience than they ever could have, you know, in the past. So who won the chicken tender challenge? Well, they said it was different. They said they're both really good, but they're different. And I would agree with that. Although my boss says that uh, our chicken tenders are far better than Raising Cane's, but he's a little bit biased. I mean, he's the CEO of the company, so, you know. I like the thing you said about uh, kind of the, the grit, like, you know, just putting signs up in neighborhoods, you know, asking for forgiveness. And it just it reminds me of like back in the day where when we were when I when I sold Cutco, I was a district manager. And to get people, 
to people to get people to come in to interview for us, we would literally go to the mall and put a business card on every car at the mall, you know, you know, for summer work or whatever. And it's just, it does take that type of hustle, you know, it's, uh, and then I, I was curious, do your, do you encourage your general managers to get heavily involved in like um, supporting the high schools and the middle schools and the, you know, the, the yeah. PTAs and things like that? Do you get, is there a, 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 an allotment that you say you should spend yeah. on that for a year? There's, there's a, there's a budget for that for sure. And you got to have that connection with the local community. Um, like I said, they're, they're the mayor of their restaurant. And a lot of them see themselves as the mayor of kind of their, their area, the representative of Outback uh, or Carabas, Bonefish, Flemings, you name it. Uh, and by the way, speaking of grittiness, Flemings is our fine dining restaurant, and it's fantastic if you have one in your area. They had no off-premises business. It just didn't exist because who would ever get delivery or carry out from, you know, a, an expensive steakhouse? But right when everything started, they – just they completely built a business out of nowhere um, and they created special uh, dishes and, and things that travel better. They, they got the right packaging and they even did things like um, they would have there, there was a couple people that came to their parking lots, would do the carry out and then set up tables and sit far away from each other and basically tailgate in the Fleming's parking lot. It was, it was pretty funny to see. Uh, but Bonefish did the same thing. They didn't really have much of an off premises business either, but, you know, they they had to do it. Uh, so bad situations, you know, like I said, it's either opportunity or necessity. Either way, you know, it gets results. Would you be able to maybe give some advice based on your experience, um, how they could maybe do some inexpensive research in their areas, what really works, you know, what, what they could focus on right now in terms of, for example, simplifying their venue? Because let's be honest, we're going to face this challenge for a few more months to come, yeah. hopefully just a few more months. Um, and you know, this is obviously a difficult time for most of them because, you know, they have limited capacity. Some of them can really just do deliveries. Um, so this might be a good time for them to to do some sort of a research too among their communities to learn what what's needed. But absolutely, you know, and them in the right direction. Absolutely, and we and we took that opportunity here to. I mean, you, you mentioned simplifying the menu. That was something we wanted to do for years, but because we were nervous about oh this customer is going to complain about this item being gone, this and that. Well, now's the time to rip the band aid. Uh, as it relates to the even the layouts of the restaurants. Again, whatever you can do to foster the social experience, but in a, you know, in a safe way for now and then ultimately in, a, in an engaging way later. Uh, we, uh, all the research that I've seen lately that was done actually mid-flight during COVID, uh, some research that we commissioned here, it says that the connection is with each other in my party. It's not the connection with the restaurant, the bar. There are, of course, some emotional connections there. But especially if you're a newer place that doesn't have the you know local tavern kind of um, kind of reputation, just giving some giving people a place to connect with each other, to connect with new people, that's it. And I, I know there's implications across lots of different you know, components of the retail experience. But uh, and on the research question, I've always found that you can you can pay thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars for surveys and focus groups, and they're all going to come out with the same thing. I want it better and cheaper. Okay. Talking to individuals and hearing, you know, what drives their behavior and what makes someone stay longer versus someone else, what makes someone visit once and never come again, what makes them come back and bring friends. People love to share that kind of information. And I used to, in my old life uh, at BCG, when I was a junior consultant, I was oftentimes sent into restaurants to do that very thing. And, you know, we would be on teams, again, that would pay – clients would pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for surveys. But, my, you know, the, the few of us that did these kind of mystery shops would bring a story to the CEO, and it meant more than any of those surveys. Um, so, yeah, I, I think just relying on, on your people and not just your best customers. Maybe it's some of your infrequent. Maybe it's some customers that don't like you. Just talk to them. They'll, they'll give you what you need to know for the most part. Would you go as far as reaching out to people that did not like you too much on a Google review, Yelp review? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, even, you know, now I get LinkedIn messages. Uh, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. I got a LinkedIn message uh, a couple, probably two months ago. 
Um, it was this woman that said that uh, her mother just had a horrible experience buying gift cards um, from one of our brands and the gift card didn't work and like all this stuff. And it was just, a, it was one of those, like everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And so I reached back out to this woman and said, Hey, you know, let me make this right. Long story short, her mother ended up, her mother who was having the problem with the gift card ended up baking me cookies and writing me a hand, a handwritten note saying, you know, Hey, thank you for listening to me about my experience. And, you know, I hope you take it to heart. And by the way, here's some cookies. Now, Wow. Was I a little worried they were laced with, you know, fentanyl? Yeah, but no, they weren't. They were actually quite delicious. But like opportunities not only to learn about what's broken with your process or your brand or what have you, but also the recovery aspect. I mean, that's a no brainer. Is every location owned by uh Bloomin Brands or are they are they some of them franchised or what's the What's the breakdown of that? It's it's about um, system wide. All of our restaurants, you know, seventy five, twenty five, something like that, owned versus franchised. But the way that we have it set up is that each of our restaurants, even in the owned portfolio, has a managing partner who's the, I guess that what you'd call the general manager. But we see them and they see themselves as entrepreneurs. They own their neighborhood. They it's their outback. It's their Carabas. Their name is literally over the door. You know, it's their outback and they do have leeway to do local marketing. They obviously they're, they're the mayor of their restaurant. They can um, they can run their own service recovery processes. Now, when it comes to creating menus and going on, you know, labor, yeah, and equipment, that kind of thing, that's pretty standardized. But, yeah, um, it's, have you heard have you heard of any particular situation? Because I'm, I'm sure, you know, they try to keep everyone communicating. Like where there was like a, a you know a, a general manager or, or, or like a territory manager where they tried something on their own and you know from a marketing perspective and it was they got just astounding results and yeah. then you shared it across the company yeah. and you know maybe it helped some markets but others it didn't take off as much and is there do you have any kind of yeah. uh, case studies or examples of that? So four or five years ago, Bloom and Brands took on delivery head on. Uh, and we actually have our own delivery fleet. So we have our own drivers. We also use third parties. We're a multi-channel company. But uh, one thing that people don't really get until they get into the off-premises, whether it's takeout or delivery business, is that it's not just about calling Uber Eats or DoorDash and saying, hey, come deliver my stuff. There's so much of it is about a culture. It's about a labor model. It's about a, you know, the technology component. And we had invested in this quite a bit. It was actually one of the projects when I was at BCG when we worked with Bloom and Brands on it uh, to decide to go heavily into that that business. Which, thank goodness, five years later, you know, we did, and we were we were ready for this environment. But part of that component was the culture and having the belief that delivery and carryout is the way to win in the future. So wind it back. You know, the managing partner is in Rock Hill, South Carolina. If anybody's been to Rock Hill, South Carolina, uh, it's, you know, it's definitely growing and booming, but not the biggest place in the world. Uh, they had just off the charts delivery volume. And it was, I mean, it was crazy. Every time we'd see the reports, it was, you know, Rock Hill, Rock Hill, Rock Hill. And so I went down there and I met with the managing partner and was like, man, like you just kill it on off premises. It's like, oh yeah, that's because we have to, we got to win. We got to, you know, we do everything we can to win in this business. And I asked them for, for some examples and these had all been communicated around, but they would do things like have a, uh, like a, you know, this political sign looking things, but the yard signs. And it would say, you know, Outback delivery available, you know, here's the website. And they put them at the entrances to subdivisions. They put them at the exits of schools all these places strategically around Rock Hill, and they were totally not allowed to do that. Like, that's not something you can do. But uh, they asked forgiveness, not permission. So they put it out there, and then, so the first delivery driver of the night would go plop them out, and then the last one would pick them up. And so that level of scrappiness, it pays off. And yeah. he inv he invested in a, uh, a big trailer, like an outback, catering trailer that he put in the parking lot 
And that was effectively a billboard for, you know, off premises, catering, you name it. So it's not like, it's not rocket science. It's having a belief that like, we're going to win and we're going to do whatever it takes. And so, yeah, he's become very much a, uh, you know, poster child for how to win an off premises. But I would tell anyone, you know, off premises is not as easy as it looks. And um, yeah, it's a necessity right now. Do you have any secret sauce? Would you would you are using with your brands for repeating that? You know, when you get somebody do the delivery, get them do the takeout. Um, do your restaurants like add some special coupons there or some you know some sort of incentive to get that business repeated again? Well, the the biggest secret is not really a secret. It's give them what they ordered, give it to them hot, and give it to them deliciously. Like that, that's it. Like if you give them a great experience, then they're going to do it again. Uh, of course, we use technology components like a, you know, X number of days after they get their order, we hit them again with an email, we'll do it again. And there's all that. But when it comes down to it, you have to set yourself up so that you're going to give them the great experience. And an example of that is setting delivery zones that will allow you to deliver somebody their food accurately and and hot and tasty um, it's also about the packaging it's also about a proper procedure in the restaurant to make sure that you know they got what they ordered and didn't have something left off uh, i mean nothing is going to drive you crazier than opening the bag and seeing that your blooming onion isn't in there so really the best form of marketing is doing what you do best and what they paid you to do uh, but yes beyond that of course we have um, encouragement through loyalty, encouragement through direct communications, um, but yeah, it's just do do what do what you do what they ask you to do. Exchange the food for the money. I was going to say if we're going through the, the the you talked about the five things you had going into 2020 and how you took one off and added another. Uh, you you referenced that you wanted to get into those at some point during the call. I thought this might be a good chance to kind of jump in that unless uh well. I mean, it's without going into too much detail, I mean, it was really about strengthening the foundation of our technology. Because I think what, what was happening that we're getting out ahead of is trying to do the cool stuff without doing the proper foundational work. It's eating your dessert before your vegetables, you know, name your, uh, name your analogy. And so everything that we are doing in 2020 that we were planning on doing and that didn't stop because of pandemia was about the foundation and it's unsexy and no one's going to, you know, walk around bragging about it, but we can't do what we do want to brag about and the sexy stuff that we do want to do without this part. And organizationally and from a leadership perspective, it's been tough because my, my colleagues on our executive team, my boss, the CEO, they want to see cool stuff. They see that other brands are doing cool stuff and my job for the last year and a half has been to say no or to say please be patient and yeah you know, my, my team and my reputation is on the line to get this stuff done but that's why we're narrowly focused on five things instead of trying to do everything all at once and that's what i would tell anybody is like if you're doing more than you know things you can count on your hand you're, you're probably doing too much and really when it comes down to it those five things it's really two things but i won't get into the details but really it's two and if we, every time someone says, what about this, what about this? Is it one of those two things? No? Okay, then forget it. Tell us the things already. The tension is there. <laughs> what, are those, nah. what are those things? <laughs> nah. Well, wait, well, it's, it's one, one, is, one is about loyalty and one is about, uh, it's about a multi-channel digital experience for our customers. Yeah, it, people don't, People don't segment restaurants or or prepared food in any way, shape, or form anymore as, oh, well, do I want to go to a casual dining restaurant or do I want to go to QSR or what? They just say, what food do I want and can I get it and how can I get it here, how fast and how easily? And more and more, it's do I have to talk to a human to make it happen? And so, you know, providing people reliable, fast, and intuitive platforms to get food where they want it to be, you're never going to win in the future, you know, in, in our business at least without that. 
And on loyalty, there's just always more to do on loyalty. And I'll just leave it at that. That's before it's over and before we have to let you go. Can you tell me what were the other three things? You said there, there are five key components for strengthening your foundation and before moving to some cool stuff. So I want to be able to give those five secret things to the form of your family uh, before they leave the call. Well, let's just suffice, suffice it to say a lot of it was about strengthening our in-restaurant um, you know, infrastructure. There's some of that. Um, again, not getting into too terribly much detail, but we had some pretty ancient network assets in the restaurant. Um, so we had to upgrade some of that. Uh, the rest of them is more, that's more down low kind of stuff that I can't really talk about. But, um, you know, you can just imagine everything was about strengthening the foundation and allowing us to do cool stuff down the road. And the great thing is that in our category, you know, we don't have Amazons and, and Googles and whatever that are behemoths that have really done all that, you know, we, that we could possibly do in our industry. And we have great competitors that are doing awesome things, but we feel like we have an opportunity here to really become a multi-channel, much more digitally focused, um, giving people what they want, when they want, where they want, and learning from companies like Amazon and Google. They're, they're not our direct competitors, but they absolutely are our competitors in, in a lot of ways. And customers are used to using things like Uber and using an app that's that easy. So we've had to look on the outside and get inspired, but as we get inspired, we have to back it up and say, well, before we do that, we got to do, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Well, going back to what you said about the, how the chicken, the chicken, oh, uh, what's the name of the chicken? Shack. Tender Shack, sorry. I will not forget that. Don't forget. Tender Shack, so that seems to be like a, a significant kind of pat on the back win for, you know, like pivot, if you will. Are there any other kind of, ideas that that you uh that, that that came up or or you know besides the initiatives i know you said not, you don't go off the path but something you know even in the last year and a half that maybe they, yeah. they shared that, hey we did we did this it did well you know this this is something we should be happy with you know yeah and it's a it's a good question because right now you need wins you need um you need some things for the morale and Tender Shack has been a great one. Uh, Aussie Grill is a company, is a brand that we've got inside our organization that's a fast casual. Uh, it's inspired by a lot of the Outback products, but everything's a little bit different. We had a freestanding one open, you know, up the, up the road here, and it's crushing it. That's been something everyone's been excited about. Uh, Outback's done some amazing things with their menu with some new products. They're excited about that. But so much about navigating the last nine months has been about finding those wins and celebrating them because they're so it's so easy to get bogged down in the mess that you just got to have some of these points of excitement and and allow yourself to to celebrate and enjoy it and so the feedback we've gotten on tender shack from the field is it's just nice to have something that gets people excited um and that's it matters our people matter that's without you know without the, you know, keeping them energized we're going to you know, fall on our face. So it's cool to have some of those things. I appreciate you spending the time with us today. And, you know, yeah. I think there's, there's definitely some nuggets that, uh, that, are, that our, our, our family will enjoy getting a window into. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it, it, there's, it's amazing that there's similarities between just, you know, when you think of Bloomin' uh, brands and just all the, uh, every, all the, the locations you have, and you think of like some of our customers where it's literally just the one location, there yeah. is a lot that translates, you know, it's like, you know, there's, it's, uh, they may not have the same resources, but there's things that are, that you're doing on a, on large scale that can be kind of a uh, couple down so they can do it on local scale. I, I, it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much Thanks, for joining us. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. All right.